As the antebellum South evolved an agrarian society reliant on enslaved labor, many of the region's early industrial efforts were directed at improving the system of plantation agriculture. The result of that economic system, one so dominated by agricultural production, was a proliferation of desirous consumers who placed high value on decorative wares imported from the North and abroad. Supply followed demand, and the region quickly became fertile land for many migratory craftsmen and their clientele, whose stories are preserved in the objects they crafted, sold, purchased, and used. This tea service, crafted and sold in Augusta, Georgia, in the middle of the 19th century, is the vessel for a story of two families, producer and consumer, each navigating the realities of a southern city on the brink of civil war. Read through the hands of its people, this service speaks to the social and economic systems that bound those who encountered it, from the shop of Connecticut-born silversmiths to the home of a wealthy family. It offers reflection on the dynamic and complex nature of material meaning, a testament to the notion that an object can be a display of craftsmanship, a statement of identity, and a tool of oppression all at once. Most importantly, perhaps, it prompts consideration of how we remember and retell the stories of material culture, which chapters we place at the forefront and which fall more easily into the background. It serves as a reminder that the most responsible telling is the most inclusive and that every object tells more than one story. The city of Augusta witnessed incredible growth and change from the beginning of the 19th century to the start of the Civil War. The establishment of the Bank of Augusta in 1810, the United States Arsenal in 1819, and the Medical College of Georgia in 1829 charted the growth of the city which had prospered for years at the end of the Great Wagon Road. By the 1830s, forced displacement and removal of the Creek and Cherokee peoples allowed for the Cotton Kingdom's ultimate extension into western Georgia, Alabama, and Mississippi. To keep people from joining those migrating west in search of prosperity, Augusta needed to create jobs and opportunities that made staying worthwhile. And so, as many southern cities evolved plantation models, Augusta built factories. If this was antithetical to southern patriotism, so too was the Great Canal that would power those factories, a plan proposed by Henry Cumming in 1844. Cumming envisioned Augusta as the Lowell of the South, and to ease the minds of those slavery apologists who denounced the North's cruel factory system, Cumming argued that the canal would, quote, lessen the South's dependence upon New England, end quote, by positioning Augusta as a major cotton market crossroads. In addition, the canal's economic boost would help provide for the city's great community of artisan families who relied on homes, schools, and work to survive. Cummings' message was clear, forget your plantation south and save your city. In the end, the language of independence and paternalism prevailed. The canal was completed in 1846, and Augusta was one of the few southern industrial centers by the time of the Civil War. Delivering on the promise of homes, schools, and work, Augusta became a desirable destination for migratory craftspeople, and by 1850, it was home to over 20% of the silversmiths working in Georgia. The Clark brothers, whose mark struck this service, were just a few of those silversmiths, and their story mirrors the rapid change of both the city and the silver trade. Born in Danbury, Connecticut, brothers Francis, Horace, and Joseph Stedman Clark were bred from a family of craftsmen. Their father, Joseph, was a silversmith who held a shop first in Connecticut and later New York before spending the last years of his life in Alabama. Advertisement records suggest that Francis Clark was the first to make the trip south, announcing his business on Augusta's Broad Street in 1816 and advertising clock and watch repair, as well as an assortment of jewelry, watches, silver spoons, and thimbles for sale. Clark's advertisements indicate that his shop was typical of the time, one with few employees that produced objects by hand with the help of basic machinery. In these early days, 
silversmiths might provide other allied skills like repair work, watchmaking, or gunsmithing, in addition to their work in silver and gold, in order to meet the needs of less populated cities and towns. Over the course of the century, these services became less common as many shops began to engage with the growing retail trade. By 1830, Horace Clark had joined his brother in Augusta, and together they formed F&H Clark at 260 Broad Street, advertising the sale of silver tea services, tumblers, astral lamps, and irons, and more. The pair took a partner in 1838, joining with George Rackett to form Clark, Rackett, and Co., and from this point, little is known of Francis in Augusta or beyond. It was this iteration of the firm that marked a 17-piece silver service, engraved with scenes of the Augusta Canal Falls and presented to Henry Cumming in appreciation of his efforts to promote Augustan industry. By the 1840s, industrial advancements and a stabilizing economy contributed to great change within the silver trade, including the creation of a national network of retailers, middlemen, and salesmen through the middle part of the century. The introduction of trade catalogs in the late 1850s and 60s allowed wholesalers and retailers to order goods at discounted prices. As a result, many small-scale silversmiths were eventually forced to work in the emerging large factories, become retail store owners or wholesale jobbers, or leave the trade altogether. Following the death of George Rackett in 1852, the Clark firm assumed the name Clark & Co., with remaining brothers Horace and Joseph Stedman Clark at the helm. The business continued as Clark & Co. after Horace's death in 1852, when Joseph Stedman resumed business in partnership with his brother-in-law, William J. Mealing. Together, they held shop at 206 Broad Street throughout the Civil War until at least 1865, when their business no longer appeared in city records. Joseph Stedman died just 10 years later at the age of 67, the last of the Danbury brothers in Augusta. Of the stories told about the nation's silversmiths, the Clark brothers exist in very few. They are not known for their great presentation pieces, like Fletcher and Gardner of Philadelphia, or as innovators in any particular style, like Samuel Kirk and his Baltimore Ray Pousset. They practiced in a city full of craftspeople, and their advertisements for silver wares are not unlike the dozens of others that littered the pages of the city's newspapers. Yet, their story of migration and adaptation is important and preserved in the objects they left behind. This tea service, bearing the Clark & Co. mark, was most likely crafted between the years 1852 and 1865, the period in which the firm operated under that name. With Ray Pousset body ornament of sea scrolls, flowers, and shells, the service reflects the Rococo revival, a decorative style that was especially pervasive in silver and popularized by Samuel Kirk as early as 1822. The style took hold of the industry by the 1830s and remained popular in the South into the second half of the century, well after it had fallen out of favor in other parts of the country. The cast and applied elements are especially indicative of the style. Handles with foliage and floral ornamentation, finials and pierced feet in the form of sea scrolls and shells, and a die-rolled border in the leaf motif. More than just appealing to popular style, though, the applied elements of this service indicate that Clark and Company engaged in a trade network that spanned at least three southern states. By the 1840s, most silversmiths were engaging in the retail trade, and it became common for local shops to source elements of silver that could easily be assembled for sale, a practice that speaks to the evolution of trade on a local and national level. The same stylistic elements might appear in the work of multiple silversmiths, as any number of shops could source material from the same supplier. This may explain why the Clark & Co. set bear striking resemblance to several other examples of silver from the region, including a seven-piece commemorative service presented to University of Georgia President Reverend Alonzo Church in 1856. Marked by silversmith Asaph King Childs, the church service is nearly identical to the one sold by the Clarks, and it suggests that the silversmith sourced forms and cast elements from the same supplier. 
Likewise, the same die-rolled border frequently appears in the work of South Carolina silversmith Samuel Wilmot, who created these two pictures for Louisa McKinley Harrison of Alabama and the Wadley family of Georgia at mid-century. Other regional silversmiths of the period, like John Mood of Charleston, Horton and Reichman of Savannah, and Hyde and Goodrich of New Orleans also included the same cast elements in their work. And so, in its form and decoration, this service preserves the story of the Clark brothers, their migration to Augusta, their understanding of regional trade networks, and their place among southern silversmiths producing work in the same style. But the service holds another story as well. As trade networks were expanding throughout the antebellum period, so spread cultural ideas and customs. Much of the silver trade relied on cultural traditions carried from England and mined from the East, providing equipment for religious services, dining practices, and tea rituals. By the 19th century, Western tea practices had evolved beyond the confines of male-only establishments and toward the female domestic sphere. The serving of tea became performative in a different way, out of the public realm where men could talk business and exchange news, and in the home, where the practice was tied to domesticity, respectability, and gentility. The ritual of tea became a cultural pattern, a quote, meaningful practice attached in common understanding to particular sets of ideas, attitudes, and commodities, end quote. These patterns, though seemingly ordinary, held implied social meaning and respectability depended on, upon proper performance of the practice. A successful tea performance relied on etiquette and equipment, and through the Victorian period, a proper service consisted of six to eight pieces in silver, a hot water kettle, tea and coffee pots, waste bowl, sugar, creamer, spooner, and tray. Celebrating marriage and the start of a new household, a tea service might feature engraving of a couple's last name, family crest, or initials. The importance of fully identifying the owner meant that it was very uncommon for a service to be engraved with only a first name. At the time of the 1850 United States Federal Census, there were four women named Amy living in Georgia's Richmond County. Amy Ann Halbert, the wife of a carriage maker. Amy Whitlock, a woman living alone. Amy Grant, a boarder in a butcher's house. And Amy Hurd the wife of a commission merchant. Isaac Hurd's profession was a lucrative one, given Augusta's position as a major crossroad in the cotton market, and he and Amy lived with their two children. Amy was from Edgefield County, South Carolina, born Amy Mosley Collier to a family of wealth and influence. She was a descendant of Samuel Ready Money Scott, the namesake of Scott's Ferry, South Carolina, and a second cousin of Henry Clay, the Secretary of State and Congressman from Kentucky. Amy was given a family name, passed down three generations on her father's side, and she gave it to her own daughter, born Amy Mary Hurd, in 1848. Amy Mary was only five years old when her mother died, and she would later drop their shared name, signing Mary Amy Hurd in legal documents and in personal correspondence. In spite of this, her father Isaac Hurd referred to her by her given name until his death, addressing her as my daughter Amy Mary in his will. Though impossible to say for certain, it seems likely that this Clark & Co. service belonged to one of the Amy Hurds, given the family's wealth and close tie to the name of the engraving. Spanning five generations, the persistence of the name bears testament to the social and cultural traditions of the antebellum South, Naming patterns of white Southern society largely reflect, reflected the period's patriarchal order and the importance of familial honor, growth, and advancement. The replacement of Christian names with traditional surnames emphasized the intensity of family lineage in a combative effort against the threat of family dissolution. Naming practices functioned to uphold the patriarchal system and fathers had preeminent right. Often, the use of a maternal surname was meant to honor the mother's family rather than the mother herself. With these patriarchal naming conventions in place, the survival of Amy's name over the span of 150 years 
supports a current theory about the relationships between women in the antebellum South, specifically the relationships between white slaveholding women. Carol Smith Rosenberg has suggested that women in the 19th century navigated their place in the patriarchal order by developing close, meaningful relationships with other women, especially their mothers and daughters. These intimate female relationships served as foils for the emotional deprivations of the paternal household in which womanly honor was most often achieved through restraint and submission. In this patriarchal order of the antebellum period, Amy's namesake tea service emerges as a material expression of feminine identity, a celebration of the bond amongst women, and an act of resistance, however small, against a social system designed by men. But this is only half of the story. By the time of the 1860 federal census, the city of Augusta had the second largest slave population in all of Georgia, which was the second largest slaveholding state in the South. Enslaved people made up 43% of the state's total population, and the average Georgia slaveholder enslaved six people. Enslaved women made up a diverse workforce of both agricultural and domestic labor, and as Thavolia Glimpf has explained, the plantation house was not merely a house, but also a workplace. The domestic nature of the work performed there did not render it a strictly private space, and this blurring of public and private served to amplify the household as a site of power negotiations. Traditional histories of Southern white women have seen them as, quote, hardworking women so handicapped by patriarchy and paternalism that their lives more closely resembled those of enslaved women than the white men who were their fathers, husbands, and brothers, end quote. The truth is that in the antebellum period, white women were slave owners and wielded their power as such. They beat slave women and killed them in ways so disturbing that historians have judged them barbaric. These instances were not mere aberrations in behavior, but critical foundations of the gender and power relations at play in Southern households. As a slave-owning family, the herds were certainly bound to these systems. Edgefield County records indicate that between 1840 and 1843, Amy and Isaac Hurd purchased 10 slaves from Amy's father. Their names were Phoebe, Harriet, Susan, Claire, Jacob, Ellis, Frank, Big Marsh, Nancy, and Sally. The naming practices and cultural patterns of white Southern society are complicated when applied to the enslaved population, who were not afforded the luxury of family continuity and were often robbed of their birth names. Implicit in its form and function, Amy's Tea Service preserves this story too. Performances of gentility were as much about displays of enslaved servitude as owning the proper tea equipment, inherent in the language used to describe the grouping of silver used for the performance of tea. The term tea service often refers equally to the objects and their usage, and the history of tea in America is intimately tied to that of enslaved labor. In this way, it becomes as much a tool of oppression as it is a display of craftsmanship or a statement of identity. In Augusta, this was a tea service, but it was also part of a story of migration, industry, patriarchy, and power. From the Clark Brothers workshop to a wealthy Southern household, this service preserves each of these stories and the most complete telling is one that considers them all.